go ahead and get started on file systems. So um, basically the whole motivation behind having file systems in operating systems is that we need persistent storage. And storage is not as persistent as we would like it to be, and it typically is more complicated than we would like it to be. So we need to have some kind of abstraction provided by the operating system. So like I said, all programs require some form of persistent storage, if for no other reason than to store the program itself, because nobody wants to type in a program over and over again. But there's a lot of other things you could come up with. Config files, input files, output files, documents. I you know, just had to write a bunch of recommendations for people, and so I have a directory of all the recommendations I've ever written. Uh, so that it's easy to, if somebody wants another one, I can just go look it up. All of that kind of stuff. You need to have some kind of persistent storage. You'd also like storage that is more likely to survive through a system crash. Um, certainly you could lose information if you're not careful, but it turns out that you can actually be careful in writing to this information. So uh, reservation systems, document editors, I really like that, you know, if PowerPoint crashes while I'm working on a slide deck, it says, hey, I recovered this presentation. Maybe you'd like it back. And, and I'm like, yeah, that'd be really nice. So there's things like that that you would like to survive through a crash. And so most computers have persistent storage in one form or another. So hard disks, less common now unless you're working on servers where you need a large amount of storage or you have a, a cheaper laptop. Uh, solid state drive for more expensive laptops or servers that you need to be really fast. Uh, USB flash drives, and so forth. So there's all kinds of things. Tape drives and optical drives still used, surprisingly enough. But they're really good for backup. And so people use them for backup quite frequently, especially the very important but frequently not utilized off-site backup so that if a meteor hits your building, um, you have your backup somewhere else and you don't lose them in the you know ensuing fire. So uh, those kinds of things uh, are frequently used for tape drives and uh, optical drives. Now you frequently have large data sets where you would like to be able to access portions of a file um, but not the entire file. So this is just sort of fleshing out some of the requirements of a file system abstraction. So uh, if we have this kind of situation we need to be able to load only a portion of a file not the entire thing. We'd like to be able to index into it somehow. And we'd also like to be able to share files across multiple processes. This is where a lot of the complexity for Project 6 comes from, is that we need to be able to manipulate a particular file concurrently from multiple processes. <clears throat> With certain rules or restrictions and so forth. Clearly this needs some kind of coordination before you end up in just some crazyville. So uh, yeah, and um, since the devices are slow, we need to manage the accesses as well, doing the kind of things we've talked about all term. I need to read a file. Well, now I'm doing I.O. against a device that's extremely slow compared to how fast the processor goes. So I can block the process and unblock it later. The OS needs to be involved in managing that. Also, since it is a slow device, but reading multiple bytes is about as slow as reading one byte, why don't I go ahead and read it in blocks of some size? Uh, so that I can just bring a whole block in, the program will then be able to access the remainder of the block roughly equally efficiently. <clears throat> now applications almost always don't care about blocks. Frequently you just care about reading in the, the sequence of data. I mean if you have an XML file, who wants to parse an XML file in blocks? You just want it to be sort of a contiguous byte sequence that you read in and parse, something like that. Uh, and so you do have these interesting issues. Different devices may have different block sizes. This is becoming true of hard disks because historically sectors were 512 bytes. Now we're getting to the point where they're 4 kilobytes most of the time. Uh, then you have optical drives, tape drives. They all have different uh, block sizes and so forth. Oh, and we'll talk about the read, write, erase stuff when we get to solid state drives because those are quite complex. Um, applications don't want to think about other things like, well, what happens when a sector goes bad? The OS has to deal with that. Thankfully, the OS does deal with it so that applications don't. I have not written any code <laughs> um, except for code that actually cared about this kind of thing where I had to think about unusable blocks or blocks that became unusable over time. So uh, also non-contiguous data sets. That's another thing that uh, the OS has to think about. So the OS provides this file abstraction that allows the application to not think about these things. We have logical units of data that I can read contiguously. At least that's the way it appears to the application. It's a linear sequence of bytes. 
and I can go ahead and, and uh, seek to a particular offset in that sequence of bytes if I want to read a specific byte. I don't have to know anything about the underlying device. Now, if I want to write an application that's really fast, then I'll think about the underlying abstractions. That's a big deal in database systems. We need to think about the storage device so that we can make it as fast as possible. But I don't have to if I don't care. Microsoft Word doesn't spend very much time thinking about this stuff. They used to spend more time about it, um, but now that we have solid state drives, they can actually take some shortcuts where they used to be very careful. Okay, so the OSS file system is what provides this abstraction. Simple enough. <clears throat> in general, we do not constrain what can be stored in a file. So we don't really say this is the format that's required. Um, the process can interpret the contents however it wants. It used to be that OSs would distinguish between text files and binary files, but now we have text files that look like binary files because we support all kinds of character sets, and we have binary files that uh, you know can be used in many different ways. And so the OS is starting to impose fewer and fewer distinctions like this as we go forward. Okay. Um, now one of the things that's interesting is that in the olden days, back before any of us used computers, thankfully, um, the OS would impose uh, structural restrictions on the contents of files because the devices imposed structural restrictions. So card readers could only store 80 character wide text files. So you were stuck. You had to have 80 character wide input data for your card reader. So that's what you did. And the output was always 132 characters that was printed. So you couldn't really manipulate binary files in the same way. You would construct them in memory, utilize them, and then kind of throw them away at the end. You wouldn't reload them. Okay. So anyway, uh, yeah, and I suppose the second point on this slide is, is interesting as well, that there are some files with specific formats typically required by the operating system. Shared libraries, object files used by the compiler, binaries that you can load and execute, those kinds of things. But in general, we don't have very many restrictions imposed by the operating system. Okay, so we refer to files by name. I know this is going to come as a great shock to you all. Uh, you know, you also have extensions, which are frequently used on operating systems to say this is the kind of file. Like I love when I, uh, you know, teach a class, I'm getting .tgz files from students because they're tarballs of their work. And I know exactly well, I don't actually know exactly what kind of file it is because sometimes people create zip files and then say, oh, it says .zip. I should just rename it .tgz, and now I have a problem. But uh, thankfully, you can write clever Python code that figures that out, and I have a very clever Python program that goes through and figures out what students submit. But usually, the extension will tell you what kind of thing you have. Uh, the portion before the extension is called the base name, and, and uh, some of you may be aware that there's Unix utilities that you can use to get just the base name or the directory name or the extension off of a particular file path. Sometimes it's very helpful when you're writing scripts. Uh, and so this term file name may refer to the entire file name, sans path ahead of it, uh, or it may uh, just be the base name. It could be either one. Okay, and there's various constraints that OSs will impose. We ran into some of those early on in the term that some OSs uh, care about case sensitivity and some don't. Linux happens to care. OS X happens not to. Windows generally doesn't care about it. And that can sometimes lead to interesting issues when you try to share files between different operating systems, as we now can do with uh, um, hosted operating systems and so forth. Okay. Let me see, what else do we want to talk about? Yeah, so once you have more than a couple files, you really need to start organizing them. Old operating systems with small disks didn't need very sophisticated directory structures, and so they would just dump everything into one directory. Okay? It tended to be that as time went on, then you'd started adding things into multiple directory levels. So we have directories or folders, and so within a directory, the file names tend to have to be unique. But across all of the directories, file names don't have to be unique. And uh, generally, you have a root directory from which all other file system contents are stored. Uh, you know, this could be per device, like on Windows, or it could be for the entire operating system, like on Linux. So there's a couple different Linux. Unixes typically do that. Okay, so if the file system doesn't have a root directory, uh, programs have to know how to find stuff themselves. And again, this is the kind of thing that you would have back in the day. If you didn't have a directory structure specifying uh, 
where files were so that you could just go look in the directory, refer to things more symbolically by file name, then you had to know, well, this file that I want to access starts here. Or you would have to actually navigate the file system yourself to find a particular file you wanted to look at. Okay, so there's, there were interesting old ways that this was done. Nowadays, everybody sort of offers the same set of facilities because it's turned out to be really useful. Now, it used to be, again, if you had a simple phone, probably none of you have simple phones anymore. Just looking around, I don't see simple phones sitting in front of every, uh, anyone. Um, you would have maybe like a single level directory structure that it could do, and that would be it. Or if you have a digital camera, clearly digital cameras create files now. They tend to follow a very simple directory structure, maybe a two-level directory structure. Okay. And uh, so they don't care. They have a very limited uh, set of functionality that they need to offer, so they have a simple directory structure. Some of these things have a name, so we'll talk a little bit about it. So single-level directory, you have all of your files in a single root directory. Uh, this is very simple when you don't have a lot of files to manage. And of course, the files have to be uniquely named. The original multi-user systems would have a two-level directory. They'd have one directory per user, and then they'd have a directory for everything. So they'd have the root, and they'd have uh, a directory per user. So like it says here, a, a master file directory and a user file directory. Of course, now we have much cooler and more sophisticated file systems, even to the point that they become bewilderingly complex. So um, typically, all modern operating systems can have a graph as their directory structure. So the top level directory is still called the root, which is weird because on trees the root's at the bottom, but in directories it tends to be at the top. And the uh, subdirectories will group files based on their purpose, so we may have a home for all of our users, or on, on Macs it's called users. And then you'll have directories for applications. It tends to be on Unix systems. You have a directory for system applications or stuff that's only used by the super user. Uh, and then you have shared libraries and so forth. You may have other directories for things like, uh, what is it, slash man for man pages and so forth. Um, a lot of these things can, can have varying structures. So you have a path from the root to the file that you want to access. That's how you refer to a given file. And you'll notice that some files might have multiple paths to them. So we have a file named C. We have two Cs, but one of them can be accessed on two different paths because uh, there's two different uh, directory entries that refer to that file's data. And we had various path separators used through the, the uh, past. Thankfully, some of them we have forgotten. I think colon was even used as a uh, path separator. So it was basically whatever character we don't want to appear in file names, let's use that for a path separator. Okay. Uh, most of the time now we use forward slash, except Windows has kind of messed everything up by doing something different. And if you want to write software that runs on both places, you have to think about these things uh, because they were nice that way. Okay, let's see. Anything else that I want to say about this? Uh, well, I'll talk about some of those other details when we start talking about file structure and directory structure. So uh, I'll, I'll skip those things for now. But uh, processes do have a current directory. I vaguely recall that this is something you have to add in Project 6, is the ability to have a current directory associated with the current process. And that allows you to resolve paths that contain relative components. So dot dot dot, I, I think we've probably all used those things, let me talk about this right now. Um, basically that allows you to say dot slash something, and so that is relative to the process's current directory, and there's rules for resolving those things. Okay? And uh, it's pretty straightforward, I don't think anybody uh, sprained their brain trying to do this kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, yeah, like I say, our users can share files, so user1 is logged in, current directory is slash home slash user1, so I can say dot dot slash user2 slash D, or whatever. And uh, you may also be aware that there's various other shortcuts for typing these kinds of things. If you're in a uh, suitably clever shell program, like tilde will be your root directory, tilde username will be somebody else's root, uh, root directory. So you could also write this as tilde user to slash D. Okay? And then the, uh, you know, the shell is clever enough to resolve those kinds of things. I believe the operating system is capable of it, too. Um, but I don't remember exactly where that's implemented. Okay.
Let's see, yeah, so you don't always want to share files with other users, and you also want some files to be protected, like there's uh, the password file in etc, which I guess nowadays we don't care about anymore, but there's the shadow password file, which you definitely want to protect, because that's where the actual login passwords are kept. Um, there's a few other things that you would like to constrain, so that not just anybody can modify stuff. And so we need to have some kind of permission mechanism. And that will go into the metadata that we store for files. Okay, so we have some details like that that we need to store. And uh, this is a simple list. So user that created the file, whether uh, when the file was uh, created or when was it last modified. Actually, both of those things are often stored. Access permissions for the file, icon associated with the file, very common on operating systems with the graphical user interface. Application or applications that can be used to open the file. Now typically that last one is stored somewhere else because you use the extension to figure that kind of thing out. Although some operating systems are clever enough to associate that with individual files so that the next time you open that file it uses the same application as the last time you opened it. So forth. Okay. Uh, but you can imagine a lot of other details. A lot of times you'll even have more generalized metadata storage mechanisms associated with the uh, files. So you'll have the fixed stuff and then the varying, uh, you know, the, the file specific stuff. Now we have this interesting thing that uh, C here, uh, home user 1 BC is a file that is also available through home user 2. So we call this thing a link, uh, which basically is how we point to a file in another directory. Okay, which is kind of a misnomer. I'll explain why momentarily. Um, because we have this thing called hard links, which is where the directory entry itself refers to a file that lives somewhere else. Okay, I'll clarify my, my terminology in just a moment. But uh, So we have this link that points to a file that lives somewhere else. So this file really is like it exists in two directories. Because you have two directories with an entry that points to C. Then you also have symbolic links, which are represented as a file that points to another file. Okay, so I hope everybody sees the distinction. You either have the directory entries referring to the file's guts, or you have a file that refers to another file. Okay? And uh, on Linux, thankfully, uh, and I should really be more general, so on Unixon, when you have symbolic links, it's, it's hidden by the mechanisms and the, uh, the infrastructure that the operating system provides. On Windows, for example, when you create a symbolic link, it clearly lists as a file in the directory. And so the operating system doesn't obscure the fact that it's a symbolic link nearly as much as you do on Unixes, which is slightly annoying. Okay. Um, Windows and Unix both support hard links as well. So you can create a hard link in Windows, and now you have multiple directory entries referring to the same file contents. Okay. Let me see if I say anything else here. Yeah, so not all file systems support hard links. FAT does not, so that's why old DOS and old Windows didn't support this kind of thing. They kind of created the symlink mechanism uh, because it was an easy way of doing it, but now NTFS easily supports hard links, and so uh, you can create hard links, but not through the user interface. You have to do it from the command line if you want to create a hard link in Windows. Okay, so the terminology... Uh, refinement that I wanted to share with everyone is that we have this notion that the hard link is pointing to a file that lives in, an, in another directory. Well, really, the way to understand this picture is the file lives on the device, and then you have multiple directory entries pointing to it. And like I say in the, the little side note, um, you keep a reference count associated with the file data, specifically in the file metadata, how many hard links are how many directory entries refer to this data. And when that count hits zero, then you reclaim the data. So it's not really correct to say C lives under user2. Really, user2 is a directory that points to the data. And user1b is another directory entry that points to the same data. So you see there's a separation between directory information and file information. And that's why early on in the class we talked about how uh, when you want to delete a file in Unix and some process has the file open, the process gets to keep using the file even though the directory entry is removed until the process closes. And at that point, 
the data is actually reclaimed. And it's because of the separation between directory information and the file data itself. Okay, so I just wanted to, and in fact, that is exactly why on Unix, when you want to delete a file, you use the weirdly named unlink command. Unlink just says remove a hard link. That's all it does. Okay, so any questions about any of this? Still pretty high level, hopefully not too complicated. <clears throat> is it possible to create cycles in this? Yes. And in fact, that's why um, sometimes you'll see uh, utilities that are, are like, well, tell it to follow sim links or tell it not to follow sim links. But you can also create cycles with hard links, and it's very easy to have a program that gets lost in a cycle forever, which, um, you know, it is definitely pro uh, possible to program around that, but uh, you definitely have plenty of programs out there that'll just get confused and chase the path forever as it gets longer and longer until the buffer overflows and then it'll crash, which makes me sad. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so files, that's enough about directories for now. We'll talk about them probably more at a future point. Uh, but basically, files are unstructured sequences of bytes, and so the file system will expose various operations, like create a file at this path so that <laughs> clearly you want some directory to refer to it after it's been created. Otherwise, why have it? Uh, delete a file at a specific path or unlink it, like I said, on Linux, and uh, rename a file if you need to do those kinds of things as well. Now, um, interesting little aside about renaming. Renaming can move a file to a different directory structure. Why not? Most operating systems allow that kind of thing. But clearly, if you want to move it to a different directory structure that's on a different physical storage device, the OS may say, no, actually, you can't do that. So you have this interesting thing under Unixes, which have a single unified file system, that moving something to a different path may actually move it to a different physical storage device. And if you have that situation, the operating system might say, sorry, I can't actually do that for you. You have to create a copy and then delete the original. Okay, yeah, so the OS maintains a current position for open files on a per-process basis. We talked about the mechanisms for that early on in the class, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. If multiple processes have a given file open, each process has its own current position. Typically, even if you have multiple file descriptors for the same open file, you'll have the same current position shared across all those file descriptors. That's Unix's approach. Okay? Um, it could do it a different way if it wanted to. That just tends to be how it works. So, but the current position will be distinct on a per-process basis. Okay, so there's uh, basically two patterns that you'll see for file system access. You'll have sequential access, where I'm scanning through a file. I say in order block by block, but typically the program will look at it as byte by byte, because that's what it's doing. Um, but the file system is being read block by block. And then you have direct access or relative access, where I say this is the offset in the file that I want to access. And somehow the file system needs to perform that direct access efficiently. This is kind of important. Um, initial operating systems were designed to support sequential access very easily. But direct access was much more challenging. And so the complexity that you see emerge in file system structures and file system uh, organization really come from supporting both sequential and direct access efficiently. So if you're ever wondering why is this file system data structure so complex, for example, why does NTFS use B-trees for accessing data files? It's so that they can do both of these things efficiently. They can do both sequential and direct access efficiently. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and different file layouts have different strengths. That should be pretty obvious. Sometimes you have things that are good for sequential access. Sometimes you'll have layouts that... Um, avoid fragmentation really effectively. Some don't avoid fragmentation very well at all, those kind of things. So there's a lot of different characteristics that you could look at for file system layouts. Okay. Yeah, and this last point, like I was saying, direct access, you have a logical position in the file that you need to map to a disk block. Do I have an efficient way of doing that mapping or an inefficient way? And so again, that's, that's a characteristic of the file system data structure. Okay, now since uh, devices are large, we can hold many uh, files at once. Um, they're accessed by blocks. We already talked about some of those kinds of things. So the file system has to keep track of what blocks are used by what files and in what order. So a really simple approach would be 
Each file occupies a contiguous region. What do I have to store? Well, really, I only need to store where the file starts, so what block does the file start in, and what size is the file. That's all I need to store, and then I can implement contiguous allocation. This happens to be what Pintos comes with. Really simple contiguous allocation. Files actually are not even allowed to grow <laughs> in the uh, current file system. You will fix all of these limitations in the sixth project, so that at least that's the goal. <clears throat> So yeah, it's a very simple directory structure. And indexing is also easy. If I need to access block i, or let's say I need to access byte i, then I can just divide i by the block size and add the starting block number to that, and then I know which block to access. So it's fast and it's simple, but it's very limited in the you know, common usage patterns that people typically have. Okay, we have external fragmentation issues, so as files are created and then deleted, and then I want to create another file of a slightly different size, or I want to make a larger one, then you have fragmentation issues that start becoming really problematic really quickly. So we can use the same technique that we actually discussed in the, um, what was it, the limit offset approach in virtual memory. Just compact. So we copy files somewhere else, and then copy them back with all the free space aggregated into one chunk. We could do something like that. Unfortunately, you frequently have to keep other people from accessing the device while you're doing this. Because if they were allowed to access it, then you might have things that interfere with this um, compacting. Now, perhaps you could allow read access, and maybe you would say, I'm going to allow some reads, but I'm not guaranteeing any performance level with the reads because I may have to move this data somewhere else before you get to access it. So you could have those kinds of constraints that you can enforce. The other problem, of course, is that programs almost always want to extend files, like log files. I don't know if any of you have done any sloughing around in log files looking for why things are crashing or why things are doing what they're doing. Um, as somebody who spent a lot of time writing software professionally, your life constantly involves that kind of thing. Log files are extended all the time. So how would you do this with a contiguous allocation mechanism? Well, what you probably have to do is have a log file format where you say my maximum log file size is 10 megabytes. So I will allocate a file of 10 megabytes and then somewhere at the beginning I'll just say this is how much of it is actually in use. So that I know at least I have a full 10 megabytes if I need it. So you could get around these problems, but boy, what a waste. Now, one thing that can be done to contiguous allocation to try to support these kinds of things is basically to allow a file to be broken up into multiple contiguous allocations. So that uh, introduces the notion of extents. And so you can just chain these extents together. And so basically, this allows you to work around some issues with fragmentation because now, while I've got a bunch of little chunks of memory spread around, that means that I can just link them together. Those become my extents. Um, but then, yeah, you have this issue that uh, now the data itself is becoming fragmented. And if I want to perform sequential access, and I happen to be stuck in the distant past using a floppy disk drive or a spinning magnetic hard disk, then the, uh, the seeks that I have to do to access the different portions of the file data are going to really add up, and it's going to make things really slow. Okay. So this is bad. Notice I say CDs and D DVDs and tapes all use contiguous allocation. That tends to be fine because CDs and DVDs aren't written very often. Okay. So that's okay. Tapes tend to be written in one shot because who wants to do direct access to a tape? Nobody, so we don't. Um, but if you're doing it for backup, then you just do a, a contiguous allocation. That's perfectly fine. And interestingly, this is as an aside, many file systems do support extents, but you'll see that they're used in a very different way. But you can actually say, I want to allocate a contiguous chunk of data on my file system for use in files. And so um, most file systems actually support the use of extents if you enable it. Another aspect of extents is it's a way that you can get up to much larger file sizes. Like if you want to get up into the petabyte file sizes and so forth, then sometimes you have to do that because the file system uh, format itself 
will limit the size of files. So extents is an easy way of, of working around that. Okay, so that's extents and contiguous allocation. Now we're going to start talking about more sophisticated allocation mechanisms. Linked allocation is basically a linked list of blocks. Yay, we all love linked lists. Linked lists are awesome. Um, you actually start to appreciate linked lists when you have to work in trees and hash tables and all those kinds of things all the time. So linked lists are really simple. Um, but basically, you'll see the directory entries uh, point to the first and the last block in each file, and each block points to the next block. Well, that seems really easy. I think I could implement that. Um, but the problem is this is really only good for sequential access, because how do I do direct access? I want to access the byte at index, you know, 9,281. How do I map that? Well, I can't. I have to actually chase through the linked list to see A, is my file that long? Maybe I could store that in a directory entry as well. And B, which block actually is it? Because I have to chase through until I find the appropriate block. So linked allocation is bad for direct access. It's okay for sequential access as long as all of these things aren't in too great uh, disorder, because if they're all over the place, then I have a lot of seeks. But if I have everything in order, then my seeks will all be small. I'll be happy. Yeah, you don't need compaction because storage is always allocated in units of blocks, so that's pretty nice. Um, but you do have an issue that since you're using the whole block, you can't use half a block for a file. If you have a bunch of tiny files, basically you're going to be losing some space just to your storage format. Not a huge deal in practice. Our files are often very large. Okay, Data fragmentation, you can see, would become a very obvious issue here. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever run defragmenters in your life, but uh, certainly there was a period of time where that was a very important thing to do. I remember running defragmenters frequently uh, for various computers I had to manage. Also, Unfortunately, we're losing a little bit of space in our blocks. Why is that a problem? Well, it's really only a problem because these blocks tend to be a power of two in size, and programmers like blocks that are powers of two in size. Why? Well, some of you did this kind of thing on your uh, PC booter where you just anded or uh, bitmasked out values to implement modulo and so forth, and it's like, yes, that's a fast way of doing it, and if buffers are a power of two in size, you can play those kinds of tricks. So um, that, would, that would play poorly with the way programmers like to write programs. So basically, what was done to try to mitigate some of these issues with a linked allocation structure was to factor out the linking part of it so that you could have your blocks used only for data and have all of your links together stored somewhere else. And that's where the file allocation table uh, file system format came from. This actually was uh, one of Bill Gates' contributions. So if you think Bill Gates is just some rich guy that everybody used to hate and now everybody loves, he's trying to stamp out malaria, um, this is one of the things that he helped create was the file allocation table structure, used heavily by DOS uh, all the way through even into Windows. Okay, so you have a directory entry. Uh, we had this was the old way of doing it. Now instead what we do is the directory entry just says these are the starting and ending blocks just as before. The file allocation table is where we actually store the next block information. And blocks themselves are used entirely for storing the data. So now programmers can use powers of two, yay, we're happy. Blocks can hold a power of two of data, and the file allocation table is stored somewhere else. Okay, so that's the idea. There are challenges and limitations, though, with this approach. So file allocation table tends to be a fixed size. And uh, that obviously makes it challenging, because what if I only have 256 entries? And I happen to have more blocks than that on my device. What do I do in that situation? Okay. The nice thing is I can load this file allocation table into memory, and now I know the layout of all my files. So that's super nice. I can just load the fat, and then I can access all the files on the device pretty easily. Um, but there's various issues, like I was starting to mention. So um, first of all, the set of file allocation table entries, since the fat is a specific size, um, I can't necessarily address all the blocks on the storage device. So what do I do? Well, I start having these fat entries reference multiple blocks together that we'll call clusters. Okay. 
Yeah, here's the uh, example. The original FAT <laughs> was uh, 8 bits per table entry, so FAT8, if you will. And uh, so I can only have 256 blocks on a device if I, need, uh, uh, if I have a device with more than 256 blocks. Now I need to start grouping blocks together. And so one of the things that you see changed over time is, well, you probably are all familiar with FAT32 because this is a good file system format for your uh, little uh, flash drive so that you can plug it into various things and have whatever operating system access to stuff. So FAT32 has 32 bits per file allocation table entry, which means you can have 2 to the 32 blocks on your device. FAT16 has 16 bits per entry, which means you can have up to uh, 65,536 entries and so forth. Okay, so you can see that this is why we want to have larger fat entries, but this takes away space for storing data. And so like I was saying, fat started to store clusters instead of just blocks uh, for each fat entry. And so you might have a cluster be 16 blocks or perhaps even larger. And this is where the second issue came um, which is that if you have a whole block being referred to by a file allocation table entry, then if I have a whole bunch of small files, I'm losing a huge amount of data because now I lose a whole cluster for a file instead of just a uh, single block. This is what it was like back in my day, kids. So, um, you know, you'd have clusters that were 32 kilobytes, clusters that were 64 kilobytes. I want to create my 100 byte basic file and run it because I'm learning to program, something like that. And I notice that the available space on my device goes down by 64 kilobytes. And I'm like, why am I losing 64K when I create a 100 byte file? It's because of fragmentation issues due to the file allocation table storage format. Okay. So yeah, um, if you have a cluster that's 16 kilobytes, like I see here on the slide, the FAT file system can only hand out blocks of that smallest size. So if I have a tiny file, then I lose a huge amount of space. This was a huge issue, which kind of motivated getting rid of fat. Okay, uh, any questions about that? Okay, let's see. So indexed allocation basically was an approach that allowed you to have an indexing mechanism that basically scales with the amount of data you need to store, as opposed to having a fixed amount of space for uh, specifying where files are. So index allocation uh, basically allows you to do a lot of things effectively. And so most operating systems now use some kind of indexed allocation mechanism. Okay, so uh, files include the indexing information. So now the file itself says this is where my data is stored. And that's really neat because now the file allocation table can be on a per block basis. It's associated on a per file basis. I have a lot of files. I lose a lot of space to indexing. If I have a few files, I only lose a few, uh, you know, a little bit of space to indexing. So it kind of scales with the system. Okay, yeah, so the index is separated out. So like the orange dotted chunk is the file data itself. The index is associated with the file, so that's what the directory entry would point to. And uh, the index knows which blocks the file actually uh, is comprised of. So both direct and sequential access are fast. Um, it's easy to translate a, an offset in the file into a block because you just load the index and use the index to figure out which block. So that tends to be pretty fast. Obviously, if you have a file that's used frequently, then the file's index information will be in the file system cache, so that'll be fast. And the other nice thing is that you can actually store metadata in that index block. So if you have a situation like this where I have hard links, multiple hard links to a file, well then I can store the important information in the file metadata that's associated with the file data on disk. And so no matter where I link to it, that metadata is still available. That's a really fantastic idea. So this is another reason why this indexed allocation mechanism is so nice. Okay, yeah, and if it was stored in the directory entries themselves, then you'd have all kinds of problems with it getting out of sync. Okay. Some of this information is stored still, like permissions, I believe, are still stored in the directory entries on Unix, but there's a lot of other stuff that can go into the file metadata itself. All right, any questions? This is the kind of thing you will have to implement for Pinto, so uh, it's not too terribly difficult. It's spelled out pretty well for you.
Okay, so yeah, the overhead in this situation is obviously the index. That's where our extra information is. We need to store it, but it is overhead. It's not the data itself. So it's challenging to try to design an index structure that works well with small files and also works well with large files. Okay? I don't want small files having giant indexes, and I don't want to have some overhead for large files because I've made optimizations for small files that large files suffer because of it. So um, I basically need to try to design this in some clever way. Now the way that uh, NTFS does it, for example, is to use B-trees. B-trees are a great data structure. They're one of my favorites. They're also a pain in the ass to implement. Um, but if you have a good B-tree implementation, this kind of indexing becomes really straightforward, and sequential access is also very straightforward to do. So that's why a lot of operating systems actually like B-trees. All right, let's see. So one option, we'll look at a few simple examples. We're not going to actually do B-trees in this class, thankfully. Um, EXT2 is a tree data structure that is very unbalanced. It's interesting how they designed it. So we'll talk about that toward the end of class. We have enough time. Okay, a linked sequence of index blocks. So we could do that. Uh, basically, each index block has an array of file pointers. Okay, so now instead of linking data blocks, we're linking index blocks. And index blocks say where the data blocks are. That's the idea. We've introduced a level of indirection. That's all we've really done with this approach. And the last pointer in the index block either says, that's it, I'm done, or it says, here's the next index block. It's good for small files because I'll have one index block. I can load it. I can look at the data inside of a small file. Um, let's see. So storage blocks of 512 bytes. We're going to keep this old school. 32-bit index entries. So I can fit 128 entries in there. 128 times 512. You can do the math. Yeah, so there's, there's some simple information here. Okay, yeah, so this is a kind of an important detail here. Uh, I say a maximum of 128 entries, but you do need to store the metadata. So let's say that uh, we need 28 entries worth, or what is that, uh, nearly 100 bytes, I suppose, for um, storing metadata. And then we have 100 entries left over. We could do 50 kilobyte files pretty easily with a single index. Now, if we decided to do something that was more well-suited to the virtual memory system so that our memory mapped files work really well, then we could use four kilobyte blocks instead. And so you can do the math and see that, uh, well, now a single index block will buy me up to a four megabyte file. I'll have some fragmentation on the file system if I need a uh, file less than four, mega or four kilobytes, but who cares? That's okay. Storage is cheap now. Um, the problem with this, I'll just sort of mention this issue. I don't know if I discuss it in more detail later on. But the problem with this for large files, does anybody see what the problem is if I have a large file? Let's say that I have a file that's like 5 or 10 gigs that I want to index into. I want to do a seek for a large file. Yeah, so I have a linked list of index blocks. I have to go through that linked list of index blocks just to find where the block is. So as the file gets larger, that overhead gets worse. It sucks. It makes, makes you sad. Right? So those are the, that's the reason why this option is not ideal for large files. So the second option is some kind of multi-level index structure where basically index pages can either refer to index pages or data pages. Okay, so that's nice. Um, now, like I say here, this is constrained so that it can uh, not refer to both. Again, that's not entirely the way that we're going to do it, uh, but you could impose some kind of constraint like that. And so the depth of the index structure can grow if I have a large file. It can shrink if I have a small file. And so a single level index would still be able to refer up to a four megabyte file, but once you got above that size, you could use a two-level index. And now the top level allows you to go into the portion of the index that you care about. And then each uh, second level index would still refer to a four megabyte extent of the file. Um, but you can see that a two-level index could be used for a four gig file, a three-level index for a four terabyte file. It grows really fast, which is why we like this kind of thing. Okay, The index doesn't get too deep. And um, the... Uh, you know, the, the overhead imposed 
looking into the index is not that big. So uh, that, that's kind of nice. This is basically your B-tree B type data structure. Okay, now um, the third option is some kind of hybrid approach, which is basically what Unix has been doing for a really long time. This is ext2, uh, and then ext3 and ext4 add facilities to this, but they basically don't change the fundamental idea. So I have an index node, that's the root index node, so this is what the file metadata goes into. Uh, basically, I have some information for data blocks. Like I say here, the first 12 disk blocks are referenced from the root inode of the file. And we call them direct blocks because you directly access them from the root index. Okay. So that basically means if you have a 50 kilobyte file, that kind of size range, then you basically only need one indexing block for storing that. That's nice. Once you get past the first 12 or so, I think that it may be a little bit larger nowadays, but once you get past the first number of direct blocks, or tiny files, then you get into the next kind of block, which are called single indirect blocks, because you take two index levels to get to them. Okay, so we had direct blocks, it was just directly accessible from the root. Single indirect blocks, I have to go through one level of indexing, one more level of indexing, I should say, before I get to the data blocks. And so like I say here, this will extend file sizes up to multiple megabytes with no problem. So now I'm basically losing just a few blocks to indexing, but I mean, I'm going to have multiple single indirect indexing blocks, so that'll allow me to grow to a certain size. If I get really large, then I can use double indirect blocks. So you see, you get into a certain range of, of index values where now you have to go through two more levels of indexes to get to the data blocks. And if you're really crazy, um, I don't know if I have it here. Yeah, you have the triple indirect blocks, which will allow you to get to the rest. Okay. So this is ext2. You can see that it has some biases in it based on file sizes and so forth. So um, ext2 kind of expects that most files are going to be small, which is probably a good guess. I mean, I, I actually haven't seen any research that talks about um, average file sizes on a file system. So that's the kind of thing that maybe, you know, somebody I'm sure has done that uh, research to figure out um, what are average file sizes. But the idea behind ext2 is let's try to optimize for smaller files. And so they have this crazy thing that they do. Okay, so double indirect and triple indirect blocks for the really large files. Okay, and again, the way to think about this, direct is one step away from the, the root. Single indirect is one more step away from the root. Double indirect is two steps away from the root. And then triple indirect is three steps away from the root. Okay, so it's some kind of weird unbalanced B-tree thingy. Okay, now um, this does impose a size limit. You'll have to think about some of these things. I can't remember if you have to do triple indirect blocks for uh, Pintos, but you do have to do at least double indirect blocks if I remember correctly. And uh, if you do the math out, you see that this does impose a size limit on your files. But if you have your data block pointers point to extents instead of just data blocks, then suddenly your size limitations become far huger. And so that's how in ext3 and ext4 we get up to really large file sizes. Now B-trees don't really have this problem. B-trees have other problems. They're really hard to implement. But uh, you can see that um, this, this data structure is a pretty straightforward data structure conceptually, but uh, everything else is, um, you know, it, it has some interesting characteristics to it. The only other thing that I think I would mention is I believe these interior indexing blocks are all just straight indexing blocks where um, they don't have the same really strange, you know, this section is single, you know, is direct, this section is single indirect, this section is double indirect. So it's below the root that things become much more uniform, but the root node is just a little bit crazy. Okay, any questions? Okay, so what we're going to do next time is start talking about a few other things to do with file systems. We don't have a lot of lectures left, so I'll see if I have the energy to create some new lectures, but we'll definitely have at least one lecture to talk about how to do the uh, last project. So, um, But I'll wait, because I'm sure all of you are still thinking a lot about virtual memory. So, all right, see you all next time.